America's Silicon Valley, the capital of innovation and technology. It's where the World Wide Web began and where top tech companies are incubated. 42% of global investment in startups happens right here within a two hour radius of San Francisco. It sounds really cliched, but I think there is the American dream. And then you come here and they're like, here, take a million dollars. This melting pot of big money, big ideas, and big dreams draws the best and brightest minds from around the world. But it's Asia that's supplying much of the brain power. People from China, India, Pakistan and the Philippines make up more than 50% of the workforce in American high tech. You may not speak English well, you may not, again as I said, you know, not come across as very sophisticated and so on. But if you're writing bloody good code, who cares? With one foot in the US and another at home, Asian tech tycoons are doing business worth billions. The East and the West, the collaboration, the connection is very, very key. Silicon Valley is really famous because once every seven or eight years, there will be a new industry explosion in which one or two of the Silicon Valley startups become a true world huge leader. I'm Ella Callan. On this edition of 101 East, we're asking what brings South and East Asians to Silicon Valley in greater numbers than any other group in the world. The ties between the tech revolution and Asia run so deep, the valley mightn't exist as we know it without the Asian influence. Chinese were among the first immigrants to the US during California's gold rush in the mid-19th century. They worked in the mines, built railroads, yet when the gold ran low, people turned against them. They were driven into what became Chinatown in San Francisco. Mr. Yi came in the next wave of migrants a century later. His fortune cookie factory has been open every day for 56 years, and he credits his success to a traditional hero. The Monkey King is a classical tale in China. He has superpowers like today's technology that enable him to make a long journey to the West. But according to Google, Fortune cookies are not Chinese. Just like today's tech industry, this innovation was born in California. The US was this land of chocolates growing up. Everybody, like all my relatives who'd come back from the US would buy chocolates, like bags of chocolates. I'm like, surely this place is filled with chocolates. I mean, that's why everyone's going there. Arthi Ramamurthy had childhood dreams of sweet success. She grew up in Southern India where she liked to pull apart gadgets around the house. She went to a local college and learned to write computer code. Then she was picked up by Microsoft before she even graduated. Even now, when I go tell people, what did you do before? I'm like, I worked on Xbox. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And as a nerd, it's, it's great. Then it gets really nerdy. She was on her honeymoon in Hawaii. We were taking all these photos of Hawaii. We'd never been there. It's beautiful. And we were like, huh, I want to be able to process these photos. So she wrote a few hundred lines of code that let you put filters over the pictures. Black and white, sepia, that sort of thing. Her husband worked on how to upload the pictures to social media straight from the phone. It was an app they called Bubblegum. 
honestly it was like this hobby project we didn't even think it was going to be this app that we could like put on the app store that was the only way we could tell our friends and say haha we wrote that app kind of thing so we just like rolled it out and it started taking off and it was like massive criticism and massive compliments and then they were like wait you wrote this on what in your honeymoon like why would you do that this is so crazy like you guys are so boring it uh, i can't believe you're like coding on your honeymoon overall it worked out okay i mean it made us want to come to the valley it made us want to go um build products other products like serious products we put all our thank you notes here at just 30 arthi has founded several startups in silicon valley her current project is lumoid introducing lumoid A simpler, straightforward way to discover and try great photo gear. But this is more than your average gadget rental site. In the background, some high-tech algorithms predict what customers need and link them up with gear that's lying idle in shops or warehouses. It's like a small problem that you start with, but that's kind of how big revolutions happen. Her plans go way beyond photography. customers want to come to us to rent items and then buy gadgets and we work with second hand stores and used electronic stores so in a way we are working in this collaborative economy somebody else's excess inventory is used by a customer um i think there is a lot more to do in that side of the business just keeping making somebody's excess inventory something that you're not using to make it accessible to somebody else you have the keys lumoid is what's known as a disruptor a company that's harnessing the web to fundamentally change how people do business. It's a young team in a closet-sized office, but don't underestimate them. Facebook, Google and Twitter all began this way. But you've got to have something to kickstart it. We are able to create videos using data. And within a decade, autopilot for your car is going to become a reality. Professional services is the next largest market to be disrupted. We've come to F50, an event where entrepreneurs have just 2 minutes to pitch to potential investors. Ideas are cheap in Silicon Valley. Running a startup company is not. So if you're interested in this investment opportunity, please come talk to me. At the break. Everyone is looking for someone willing to write a check that could make their dream concept a reality. It's one of the biggest reasons people move to Silicon Valley from around the world. The money is right here. You got to make me skinnier. Yeah. Remove more, even my more, even more. And make my eyes blue. <laughs> oh my you're, goodness. You're, you're, It's an app that changes my image in real time. Oh my god, look at that. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm a skeleton. All right, we're at F50 funded, which is one of the hottest events in Silicon Valley. There are people worth billions in this room. And check out this. <laughs> at least 12 of the 50 entrepreneurs pitching today have a connection to Asia. People like Victor Wang. So there's a lot of things coming together, right? So there's the fact that um You know, I was born in Taiwan. I moved to Canada when I was really little, and then I ended up at MIT doing human-computer interaction research for NASA's Tello Robotics program. Uh, and I was, you know, writing software and running these clinical studies in hospitals and seeing how people and technology interact. And then I graduated. It was time to start a startup. Oh, you're always saying that. His startup is called Jerry Joy. It's a software program that cares for dementia patients through an avatar on a computer tablet. The cute animal on the screen is actually controlled by a team of health workers in the Philippines. So there's our staff in the Philippines, and then there's Ahmed who's from Pakistan, uh who's our chief medical officer here from Stanford doing psychiatry stuff. Um and then my co-founder Shuo is, you know, from from Tsinghua University in China. Do you think Silicon Valley would be so successful if it wasn't for Asian innovation? I mean clearly not when you look at the number of Asian founded startups like there wouldn't be a Yahoo, you know, there wouldn't be a YouTube. There's something about the SF Bay area um where like success breeds success. <laughs> Up until about 1985 or 
Silicon Valley was primarily integrated with the American market, and you really didn't see that many Asian entrepreneurs. Since then, there's been a steady flow. A lot of people came to study at American universities, stayed here, and became successful entrepreneurs. So you have 25 years of people from Asia who did very well here in Silicon Valley. Looking for yeah, potential Chinese uh, investor or product. You've probably never heard of Hans Tung, but he's a big deal. If people ask me, are you American or Chinese, uh, I'm both. And increasingly, you will see people who can uh, extrapolate between the two, uh, two markets. Getting a business card into his hands can make or break a dream. Yeah, you me. Born in China, Hans went to Stanford University in the US. But he made his name by backing Chinese smartphone manufacturer Xiaomi. It now turns over $5 billion in annual sales. He helped bring Skype to China and is one of six Chinese venture capitalists on this year's Forbes Midas list. In China, um, despite what people in the West think, it is an extremely hard place to build startups. That's why Hans lives 50-50 in the US and China. Combining the power of huge Asian markets with the fast pace innovation hub that's Silicon Valley. I think the education system, government regulations, all of that are a factor. Um, but I think what Asia benefits is having a huge market. I encourage all, uh, the Southeast Asian entrepreneurs to spend time in China to see a different world. Because uh, while well, the US is great for innovation, China represents a different kind of business model that could be more prominent in the rest of the world over the next 10 years. The experts agree the east-west combination is increasingly the key to making it big in high tech. I think that the biggest difference I see is that more of the students who come from Asia are telling me that they intend to go back and start something really within a year or two. And that's something that I've only seen really in the last seven or eight years. Uh, before that, people were staying here, their families were pushing them to stay here, but a lot of them really see opportunities uh, back in Asia that are bigger than the opportunities here. But there's another reason entrepreneurs might be heading back to Asia. Getting a visa is tough. If you're not born in the US, you'll almost need to win a lottery to stay. Yash Navaneni is visiting Silicon Valley from India, but he's on borrowed time. Here on a tourist visa, he's got just a few days left to secure an investor for his online gaming company. Yash is crashing on the couch of a friend who works at Microsoft, but he's locked himself out. Can somebody of you give me a call? So he's trying to find the key in time to make it to his next meeting. This, this is my first time in the valley and uh, we have this big perception uh, that you know it's, it's a paradise for entrepreneurs. All the angels would essentially be having wings floating around, uh, dropping in their uh, small checks in the entrepreneur's pocket. But it's not quite like that. Things move at a much faster pace here than in India. I think uh, I was a little underprepared uh, coming in here and uh, um, I was working really fast, you know, sending ar across pitches uh, uh, to different people, uh, you know, trying to network with them. Uh, here you could pretty much have, you know, five to ten meetings uh, in a day. But even if he gets a breakthrough, the big problem is getting a visa to stay. The most common one for engineers is called H-1B, but there's a limit on how many of those they give out each year. H-1B is, uh, is, is pretty much like a lottery that happens, right? So, uh, you know, especially from uh, folks from India and China, uh, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of applications that are coming in through. The other way is really expensive. To get an entrepreneur's visa, Yash will have to invest $1 million or employ 10 US citizens and invest half a million which pretty much excludes the vast majority of entrepreneurs from Asia. Definitely, I mean, uh, I mean, in India having a million dollars uh, would mean that you, you kind of have a palatial bungalow with few servants around with a couple of cars and, uh, you know, even if you don't pretty much work, you're, you, you, you can essentially live your life uh, happily for, uh, you know, 
for you know uh, for eternity if you may call it for the next 10 years Yash will probably look at hiring a few sales guys in Silicon Valley if he can afford it, but keep his team of engineers and offer staff in India. But he won't give up on his dream. The world is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's what, seven to eight billion people around, and uh, the Facebooks and Googles have conquered uh, the first billion, right? And uh, now, now, now that's a done story. Uh, so it's, it's the second and the third billion that's going to count. and. Uh, most of it is essentially from Asia. It's not just frustrating for the people trying to get into the US. Employers can't hire Asian talent fast enough. Good to see you. Uh, financing a new round next week, so we're financing a new Zia Yusuf trod the well-worn path of coming to the United States from Pakistan as a student. He was able to stay and build his career, first at the World Bank, then Goldman Sachs, and then software giant SAP, where he rose to become a top manager. I'm excited to ride in his electric car. These are all the rage in Silicon Valley. It's, it's almost completely, it's completely silent. It's completely silent. Um. I'm loving this Tesla. <laughs> Today, Zia is steering Streetline, a startup that's revolutionising car parking. He's obsessed with using the internet to get cities to talk. In this case, the city's telling us where the free parking spots are. He foresees a world where everything, even inanimate objects, are connected to the web and can feed you information. This is the Internet of Things, but in a connected car. As cars are coming in and out of parking spots somewhere in the world, it's getting picked up by that, uh, it's getting picked up by that number. For this magic to happen, Streetline relies on a team of outsourcers in India as well as its core staff in Silicon Valley. You will not find a company today that doesn't have a portion of their engineering team sitting somewhere else. In some cases, you'll have startups where the entire engineering team is sitting in Pakistan or China or, or India. So, so this is showing right here. We're standing here. Yep, exactly right. And there's right. the open spot. There you go. It's giving us the data. So this is the whole kind of smart city foundation if you will, and, uh, and people didn't think that it would start with parking. <laughs> Where we put this? Yeah, so this one. Zia would prefer to hire locally, but the problem is he just can't find engineers here. Universities aren't graduating enough, and only the really big tech companies can afford them. The starting salary for a computer engineer in Silicon Valley is 165000 Hiring in Silicon Valley is really, really tough. I mean, as a CEO, that's where you spend the bulk of your time. Um, finding the right people for positions is, is incredibly difficult. Uh, finding engineers is even, even tougher. We have to pay $20,000 per person we hire just on recruiting fees. It's, it's ridiculous because there's not enough talent, um, and, and that has to change. How important is diversity to the Valley then? Would Silicon Valley be Silicon Valley without all these migrants coming from Asia? It's a good question. I, uh, no, I don't think so, because it's, uh, the U.S. wouldn't be the U.S. without you know, people coming from all over the world um, and, and making it the country it is. And I think Silicon Valley in particular, um, because of the emphasis on the technology, because of uh, when you think about building great products, you have to break the mold. You have to think differently. Directions to Google. Which Google? Tap the one you want. Getting directions to Googleplex. The thing about Silicon Valley is it's really spread out. It doesn't exist all in one valley. You have to drive quite far. Starting route to Googleplex. Google recently got a lot of bad press after it released numbers on the makeup of its workforce. Despite the demand for Asian talent and some of its most innovative minds being of Asian descent, over 60% of its workforce is white, 70% male. Less than 1% of leadership at Google is female and Asian, and actually, most of the big tech companies are run by white men. Here's Marva. Wow.
which is why I want to meet Weili Dai. All right, we're at the headquarters of Marvell and we're about to meet someone very important. Wei Li has been on the Forbes list of 100 most powerful women in the world for three years running. She's a self-made billionaire who co-founded Marvell Technologies, one of the top five semiconductor companies in the world. There's a good chance that most of your gadgets have a little Marvell silicon chip inside. She's also a mother of two. Do you think that when you were coming up, people underestimated you? I would say maybe the did not anticipate somebody coming here with not even speaking the language and be a survivor, right? And be a geek. Wei Li didn't speak a word of English when she arrived from Shanghai at 17, but she won a spot at Berkeley's prestigious computer science program, where she met her husband. Together at their kitchen table, they came up with the idea for a semiconductor company. Weili admits she's probably unlikely to have had the same success if she stayed in China. Definitely is the East and West combination and definitely is landed in the center of innovation, Silicon Valley, in my case. Asia has been key to Marvell's success. It has design centers located around the world, including six countries in Asia. Fabrication of the silicon chips is outsourced to vendors, including major companies in Taiwan, making Asia an integral part of Marvell's day-to-day -day operations. Do you think that in the technology boom, Asia is losing its best and brightest to the US? Or do you think that the US is training the best and brightest who are going back to Asia? As time goes on, as the technology that reach out to everywhere, and you can find a a little genius in Africa, in Asia, Europe, anywhere, and also as a girl, a female geek, and I want you know the next generation girls to know it's absolutely possible. It's you know girls today can lead all industry. It turns out to be true that anything can happen in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Remember Arthi and the photography rental company? Investors recently gave her a big fat check. What does it feel like to be handed more than a million dollars? There's this one day of like random burst of confidence and then there are days when it's just terrifying. You're like, why would they do that? They're all making a mistake and you have this severe imposter syndrome. I remember when I first told my dad about, oh, I'm an entrepreneur now, and he's like, is that word for being homeless? Like, is that the same thing? Are you making any money? How does this work? And I'm like, well, you build this company and customers really like you and you're like, it's like starting a business in India, but you have venture capitalists and they're giving you money. Why would they do that? I mean, do they not know that you gave up this really good job to do this? she's ready to take on the world. So far, she's managed to do wonders in just a few square metres of real estate. But you get the feeling things are about to change, big time. And we're moving to a bigger office space. <laughs> she's on her way to achieving the dream that's drawing the best talent from across Asia to this small but powerful corner of America. Silicon Valley, a place where it can seem like the future is unfolding before your eyes. Fortunes are made and lost here. But everyone still needs a dose of good old fashioned luck. Oh, you're too very lucky. Your whole, your whole life lucky. My whole life is lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yee. Uh, good for you. Yay, my whole life lucky. You, you keep it. I will, I will okay. keep it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you.